I Love Thee by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson I love thee, I love thee, tis all that I can say. It is my vision in the night, my dreaming in the day, the very echo of my heart, the blessing when I pray. I love thee, I love thee, is all that I can say. I love thee, I love thee, is ever on my tongue. In all my proudest poesy that chorus still is sung. It is the verdict of my eyes amidst the gay and young. I love thee, I love thee, a thousand maids among. I love thee, I love thee. Thy bright hazel glance, the mellow lute upon those lips, whose tender tones entrance. But most dear heart of hearts thy proofs, that still these words enhance i love thee i love thee whatever be thy chance in the poem this recording is in the public domain lines by thomas hood read for LibriVox.org by drew conway second of december 2016 Kent Let us make a leap, my dear, in our love of many a year, and date it very far away, on a bright clear summer day, when the heart was like a sun, to itself and falsehood none, and the rosy lips a part of the very loving heart. And the shining of the eye, but a sigh to know it by. When my faults were all forgiven, and my life deserved of heaven. Dearest, let us reckon so, and love for all that long ago. Each absence count a year complete, and keep a birthday when we meet. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. False Poets and True by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org To Wordsworth Look how the lark soars upward and is gone, Turning a spirit as he nears the sky. His voice is heard, but body there is none To fix the vague excursions of the eye. So... Poets' songs are with us, though they die obscured and hid by death's oblivious shroud, and earth inherits the rich melody like raining music from the morning cloud. Yet few there be who pipe so sweet and loud their voices reach us through the lapse of space. The noisy day is deafened by a crowd of undistinguished birds, a twittering race, but only lark and nightingale forlorn fill up the silences of night and morn. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Two Swans, a fairy tale by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Simona Russo. Immortal Imogen, crowned queen above the lilies of thy sex, vouchsafe to hear a fairy dream in honor of true love, true above ills and frailty and all fear perchance a shadow of his own career whose youth was darkly prisoned and long twined by serpent sorrow till white love drew near and sweetly sank him free and round his mind a bright horizon threw wherein no grief may wind i saw a tower builded on a lake mocked by its inverse shadow dark and deep that seemed a still intenser night to make, wherein the quiet waters sank to sleep, and whatsoe'er was prisoned in that keep, a monstrous snake was warden, round and round in sable ringlets I beheld him creep, blackest amid black shadows to the ground, whilst his enormous head the topmost turret crowned from whence he shot fierce light against the stars, making the pale moon paler with affright, 
and with his ruby eye out threatened Mars, that blazed in the mid heavens hot and bright, nor slept nor winked, but with a steadfast spite watched there one looks and tremblings in the skies, and that he might not slumber in the night, the curtain lids were plucked from his large eyes, so he might never drowse but watch his secret prize. Prince or princess, in dismal durance spent, victims of old enchantment's love or hate, their lives must all in painful sighs be spent, watching the lonely waters soon and late, and clouds that pass and leave them to their fate, or accompany their grief with heavy tears. Meanwhile, that hope can spy no golden gate for sweet escapement, but in darksome fears they weep and pine away as if immortal ears. No gentle bird with gold upon his wing will perch upon the grate. The gentle bird is safe in leafy dell and will not bring freedom's sweet keynote and commission word learned of a fairy's lip for pity stirred lest while he trembling sings untimely guest watched by that cruel snake and darkly heard he leave a window on her lonely nest to press in silent grief the darlings of her breast no gallant knight adventurous in his bark will seek the fruitful perils of the place to rouse with dipping oar the waters dark that bear that serpent image on their face and love brave love though he attempt the base nerved to his loyal death he may not win his captive lady from the strict embrace of that foul serpent clasping her within his sable folds like eve enthralled by the old sin but there is none no knight in panoply nor love entrenched in his strong steely coat no little speck no sail no helper nigh no sign no whispering no plash of boat the distant shores show dimly and remote made of a deeper mist serene and gray and slow and mute the cloudy shadows float over the gloomy wave and pass away chased by the silver beams that on their marges play and bright and silvery the willows sleep over the shady verge no mad winds tease their hoary heads but quietly they weep their sprinkling leaves half fountains and half trees their lilies be and fairer than all these a solitary swan her breast of snow launches against a wave that seems to freeze into a chaste reflection still below twin shadow of herself wherever she may go and forth she paddles in the very noon of solemn midnight like an elfin thing charmed into being by the argent moon whose silver light for love of her fair wing goes with her in the shade still worshipping her dainty plumage all around her grew a radiant circle like a fairy ring and all behind a tiny little clue of light to guide her back across the waters blue and sure she is no meaner than a fay redeemed from sleepy death for beauty's sake by old ordainment silent as she lay touched by a moonlight wand i saw her wake and cut her leafy slough and so forsake the verdant prison of her lily peers that slept amidst the stars upon the lake and breathing shape restore to human fears a new-born love and grief self-conscious of her tears and now she clasps her wings around her heart and near that lonely isle begins to glide pale as her fears and oft-times with a start turns her impatient head from side to side in universal terrors all too wide to watch and often to that marble keep 
upturns her pearly eyes as if she spied some foe and crouches in the shadow steep that in the gloomy wave go diving fathoms deep and well she may to spy that fearful thing all down the dusky walls in circlets wound alas for what rare prize with many a ring girding the marble casket round and round his folded tail lost in the gloom profound terribly darkens the rocky base but on the top his monstrous head is crowned with prickly spears and on his doubtful face gleam his unwearied eyes red watchers of the place alas of the hot fires that nightly fall no one will scorch him in those orbs of spite so he may never see beneath the wall that timid little creature all too bright that stretches her fair neck slender and white invoking the pale moon and vainly tries her throbbing throat as if to charm the night with song but hush it perishes in sighs and there will be no dirge set swelling though she dies she droops she sings she leans upon the lake fainting again into a lifeless flower but soon the chilly springs anoint and wake her spirit from its death and with new power she sheds her stifled sorrow in a shower of tender song timed to her falling tears that wins the shady summit of that tower and trembling all the sweeter for its fears fills with imploring moan that cruel monster's ears and lo the scaly beast is all depressed subdued like argus by the might of sound what time apollo his sweet lute addressed to magic converse with the air and bound the many monster eyes all slumber drowned so on the turret top that watchful snake pillows his giant head and lists profound as if his wrathful spite would never wake charmed into sudden sleep for love and beauty's sake his prickly crest lies prone upon his crown and thirsty lip from lip disparted flies to drink that dainty flood of music down his scaly throat is big with pent-up sighs and whilst his hollow ear entranced lies his looks for envy of the charmed sense are fain to listen till his steadfast eyes stung into pain by their own impotence distill enormous tears into the lake immense o oh, tuneful swan o oh, melancholy bird sweet was that midnight miracle of song rich with ripe sorrow needful of no word to tell of pain and love and love's deep wrong hinting a piteous tale perchance how long thy unknown tears were mingled with the lake what time disguised thy leafy maids among and no eye knew what human love and ache dwelt in those dewy leaves and heart so nigh to break therefore no poet will ungently touch the water lily on whose eyelids dew trembles like tears but ever hold it such a human pain may wander through and through turning the pale leaf paler in its hue wherein life dwells transfigured not entombed by magic spells alas whoever knew sorrow in all its shapes leafy and plumed or in gross husks of brutes eternally inhumed and now the winged song has scaled the height of that dark dwelling build it for despair and soon a little casement flashing bright widens self opened into the cool air that music like a bird may enter there and soothe the captive in his stony cage for there is not of grief or painful care 
but plaintive song may happily engage from sense of its own ill and tenderly assuage and forth into the light small and remote a creature like the fair son of a king draws to the lattice in his jewelled coat against the silver moonlight glistening and leans upon his white hand listening to that sweet music that with tenderer tone salutes him wondering what kindly thing is come to soothe him with so tuneful moan singing beneath the walls as if for him alone and while he listens the mysterious song woven with timid particles of speech twines into passionate words that grieve along the melancholy notes and softly teach the secrets of true love that trembling reach his earnest ear and through the shadows dun he missions like replies and each to each their silver voices mingle into one like blended streams that make one music as they run ah love my hope is sooning in my heart a sweet my cage is strong and hung full high alas our lips are held so far apart thy words come faint they have so far to fly if i may only shun that serpent eye ah me that serpent eye doth never sleep then nearer thee love's martyr i will die alas alas that word has made me weep for pity's sake remain safe in thy marble keep my marble keep it is my marble tomb nay sweet but thou hast there thy living breath i to expand in size for this hard doom but i will come to thee and sing beneath and nightly so beguile this serpent wrath nay i will find a path from these despairs ah needs then thou must tread the back of death making his stony ribs thy stony stairs behold his ruby eye how fearfully it glares full sudden are these words the princely youth leaps on the scaly back that slumbers still unconscious of his foot yet not for ruth but numbed to dullness by the fairy skill of that sweet music all more wild and shrill for intense fear that charmed him as he lay meanwhile the lover nerves his desperate will held some short throbs by natural dismay then down the serpent track begins his darksome way now dimly seen now toiling out of sight eclipsed and covered by the envious wall now fair and spangled in the sudden light and clinging with wide arms for fear of fall now dark and sheltered by a kindly pole of dusky shadow from his wakeful foe slowly he winds adown dimly and small watched by the gentle swan that sings below her hope increasing still the larger he doth grow but nine times nine the serpent folds embrace the marble walls about which he must tread before his anxious foot may touch the base long in the dreary path and must be sped but love that holds the mastery of dread braces his spirit and with constant toil he wings his way and now with arms outspread impatient plunges from the last long coil so may all gentle love ungentle malice foil the song is hushed the charm is all complete and two fair swans are swimming on the lake but scarce their tender bills have time to meet when fiercely drops adown that cruel snake his steely scales a fearful rustling make like autumn leaves that tremble and foretell the sable storm the plumy lovers quake and feel the troubled waters pant and swell heaved by the giant bulk of their pursuer fell 
his jaws wide yawning like the gates of death his horrible pursuit his red eyes glare the waters into blood his eager breath grows hot upon their plumes now minstrel fair she drops her ring into the waves and there it widens all around a fairy ring wrought of the silver light the fearful pair swim in the very midst and pant and cling the closer for their fears and tremble wing to wing bending their course over the pale gray lake against the pallid east where in light played in tender flushes still the baffled snakes circle them round continually and bayed hoarsely and loud forbidden to invade the sanctuary ring his sable mail rolled darkly through the flood and writhed and made a shining track over the water's pale lashed into boiling foam by his enormous tail and so they sailed into the distance dim into the very distance small and white like snowy blossoms of the spring that swim over the brooklets followed by the spite of that huge serpent that with wild affright worried them on their course and sore annoy till on the grassy marge i saw them light and change anon a gentle girl and boy locked in embrace of sweet unutterable joy then came the morn and with her pearly showers wept on them like a mother in whose eyes tears are no grief and from his rosy bowers the oriental sun began to rise chasing the darksome shadows from the skies wherewith that sable serpent far away fled like a part of night delicious sights from waking blossoms purified the day and little birds were singing sweetly from each spray end of poem this recording is in the public domain Ode on a Distant Prospect of Clapham Academy by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk Ah me, those old familiar bounds That classic house, those classic grounds My pensive thought recalls What tender urchins now confine what little captives now repine within yon irksome walls ay that's the very house i know its ugly windows ten a row its chimneys in the rear and there's the iron rod so high that drew the thunder from the sky and turned our table beer there i was birched there i was bred there like a little adam fed from learning's woeful tree the weary tasks i used to con the hopeless leaves i wept upon most fruitless leaves to me the summoned class the awful bow i wonder who is master now and wholesome anguish sheds how many ushers now employs how many maids to see the boys have nothing in their heads and mrs s does she abet like pallas in the parlor yet some favored two or three the little crichtons of the hour her muffin medals that devour and swill her prize bohe ay there's the playground there's the lime beneath whose shade in summer's prime so wildly i have read who sits there now and skims the cream of young romance and weaves a dream of love and cottage bread who struts the randall of the walk who models tiny heads in chalk who scoops the light canoe what early genius buds apace where's pointer harris bowers chase hal bayless blythe carew 
alack they're gone a thousand ways and some are serving in the greys and some have perished young jack harris weds his second wife hal bayless drives the wane of life and blithe carew is hung grave bowers teaches a b c to savages at owyhee poor chase is with the worms all all are gone the olden breed new crops of mushroom boys succeed and push us from our forms lo where they scramble forth and shout and leap and skip and mob about at play where we have played some hop some run some fall some twine their crony arms some in the shine and some are in the shade lo there what mixed conditions run the orphan lad the widow's son and fortune's favored care the wealthy born for whom she hath macadamized the future path the nabob's pampered heir some brightly starred some evil born for honor some and some for scorn for fair or foul renown good bad indifferent none may lack look here's a white and there's a black and there's a creole brown some laugh and sing some mope and weep and wish their frugal sires would keep their only sons at home some tease their future tense and plan the full-grown doings of the man and plant for years to come a foolish wish there's one at hoop and four at fives and five who stoop the marble taw to speed and one that curvets in and out reining his fellow cob about would i were in his steed yet he would gladly halt and drop that boyish harness off to swap with this world's heavy van to toil to tug o oh, little fool while thou canst be a horse at school to wish to be a man perchance thou deem'st it were a thing to wear a crown to be a king and sleep on regal down alas thou know'st not kingly cares for happier is thy head that wears that hat without a crown and dost thou think that years acquire new added joys dost think thy sire more happy than his son that manhood's mirth oh go thy ways to drury lane when plays and see how forced our fun thy taws are brave thy tops are rare our tops are spun with coils of care our dumps are no delight the elgin marbles are but tame and tis at best a sorry game to fly the muse's kite our hearts are dough our heels are lead our topmost joys fall dull and dead like balls with no rebound and often with a faded eye we look behind and send a sigh towards that merry ground then be contented thou hast got the most of heaven in thy young lot there's sky blue in thy cup thou'lt find thy manhood all too fast soon come soon gone and age at last a sorry breaking up end of poem this recording is in the public domain song by thomas hood read for LibriVox.org by drew conway second of december two thousand and sixteen kent 
There is dew for the floweret, and honey for the bee, and bowers for the wild bird, and love for you and me. There are tears for the many, and pleasures for the few, but let the world pass on, dear, there's love for me and you. There is care that will not leave us, and pain that will not flee, but on our earth unaltered sits love tween you and me. Our love it never was reckoned, yet good it is and true. It's half the world to me, dear, it's all the world to you. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Water Lady by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Alas the moon should ever beam To show what man should never see. I saw a maiden on a stream, And fair was she. I stayed a while to see her throw her tresses black, That all beset the fair horizon of her brow With clouds of jet. I stayed a little while to view her cheek, that wore in place of red the bloom of water, tender blue, daintily spread. I stayed to watch a little space her parted lips if she would sing. The waters closed above her face with many a ring, and still I stayed a little more. Alas, she never comes again. I throw my flowers from the shore and watch in vain. I know my life will fade away. I know that I must vainly pine, for I am made of mortal clay, but she's divine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Autumn by Thomas Hood. Read for LibriVox by Recording Person. The autumn is old, the sear leaves are flying. He hath gathered up gold, and now he is dying. Old age begins sighing. The vintage is ripe, the harvest is heaping, but some that have sowed have no riches for reaping. Poor wretch, fall a-weeping. The years in the wane, there is nothing adorning. The night has no eve, and the day has no morning. Cold winter gives warning. The rivers run chill, the red sun is sinking, and I am grown old, and life is fast shrinking. Here's an hour for sad thinking. End of the poem. This recording is in the public domain. I Remember, I Remember by Thomas Hood. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. I remember, I remember, the house where I was born, the little windows where the sun came peeping in at morn. He never came a wink too soon, nor brought too long a day, but now I often wish the night had borne my breath away. I remember, I remember, the roses red and white, the violets and the lily cups, those flowers made of light, the lilacs where the robin built, and where my brother sat, the laburnum on his birthday, the tree is living yet. I remember, I remember, where I was used to swing, and thought the air must rush as fresh to swallows on the wing. My spirits flew in feathers then, that is so heavy now, and summer pools could hardly cool the fever on my brow. I remember, I remember, the fir trees dark and high, I used to think their slender tops were close against the sky. It was a childish ignorance, but now tis little joy to know I'm farther off from heaven than when I was a boy. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Poet's Portion by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Bruce Kachuk. What is a mind, a treasury, 
a dower a magic talisman of mighty power a poet's wide possession of the earth he has the enjoyment of a flower's birth before its budding ere the first red streaks and winter cannot rob him of their cheeks look if his dawn be not as other men's twenty bright flushes ere another kens the first of sunlight is abroad he sees its golden lection of the topmost trees and opes the splendid fissures of the morn when do his fruits delay when doth his corn linger for harvesting before the leaf is commonly abroad in his piled sheaf the flagging poppies lose their ancient flame no sweet there is no pleasure i can name but he will sip it first before the lees tis his to taste rich honey ere the bees are busy with the brooms he may forestall june's rosy advent for his coronal before the expectant buds upon the bough twining his thoughts to bloom upon his brow oh blessed to see the flower in its seed before its leafy presence for indeed leaves are but wings on which the summer flies and each thing perishable fades and dies escaped in thought but his rich thinkings be like overflows of immortality so that what there is steeped shall perish never but live and bloom and be a joy forever End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ode to the Moon by Thomas Hood. Read for LibriVox.org by recording person. Ode to the Moon. 1. Mother of Light, how fairly dost thou go over those hoary crests, divinely led? Art thou that huntress of the silver bow, fabled of old? Or rather dost thou tread those cloudy summits thence to gaze below, like the wild chamois from her alpine snow, where hunter never climbed, secure from dread? How many antique fancies have I read of that mild presence, and how many wrought, wondrous and bright, upon the silver light, chasing fair figures with the artist thought? 2. What art thou like? Sometimes I see thee ride, a far-bound galley on its perilous way, whilst breezy waves toss up their silvery spray. Sometimes behold thee glide, clustered by all thy family of stars, like a lone widow through the welkin wide, whose padded cheek the midnight sorrow mars. Sometimes I watch thee on from steep to steep, timidly lighted by thy vestal torch, till in some lap main cave I see thee creep, to catch the young Endymion, asleep, leaving thy splendour at the jagged porch. 3. Oh, thou art beautiful, however it be, Huntress or Diane, or whatever named, and he, the various pagan, that first framed, a silver idol, and ne'er worship thee. It is too late, or thou shouldst have my knee, too late now to the old Ephesian vows, and not divine the crescent on thy brows. Yet call thee nothing but the mere mild moon behind those chestnut boughs, casting their dappled shadows at my feet. I will be grateful for that simple boon in many a thoughtful verse and anthem sweet, and bless thy dainty face whenever we meet. 4. In nights far gone, a hey, far away and dead, before care fretted with a lidless eye, I was thy wooer on my little bed letting the early hours of rest go by, to see thee flood the heavens with milky light, and feed thy snow-white swans before I slept. For thou wert then purveyor of my dreams, thou wert the fairies' armourer that kept their burnished helms and crowns and corslets bright, their spears and glittering mails, and ever thou didst spill in winding streams, sparkles and midnight gleams. 
for fishes to new gloss their ardent scales five why sighs why creeping tears why clasped hands is it to count the boy's expended dower that fairies since have broke their gifted wands that young delight like any o'erblown flower gave one by one its sweet leaves to the ground why then fair moon for all thou markest no hour thou art a sadder dial to old time than ever i have found on sunny garden plot or moss-grown tower mottled with stern and melancholy rhyme six why should i grieve for this oh i must yearn whilst time conspirator with memory keeps his cold ashes in an ancient urn richly embossed with childhood's revelry with leaves and clustered fruits and flowers etern eternal to the world though not to me ay there will those brave sports and blossoms be the deathless wreath and undecayed festoon when i am hearsed within less than the pallid primrose to the moon that now she watches through a vapour thin seven so let it be before i live to sigh though wert an avon and a thousand rills beautiful orb and so whene'er i lie trodden thou wilt be gazing from thy hills blessed be thy loving light wherever it spills and bless thy fair face o mother mild still shine the soul of rivers as they run still lend thy lonely lamp to lovers font and blend their plighted shadows into one still smile at even on the bedded child and close his eyelids with thy silver wand end of poem this recording is in the public domain sonnet by thomas cloud read for LibriVox.org by jason in panama sonnet written in a volume of shakespeare how bravely autumn paints upon the sky the gorgeous flame of summer which is fled hues of all flowers that in their ashes lie trophied in that fair light whereon they fed tulip and hyacinth and sweet rose red like exhalations from the leafy mould look here how honour glorifies the dead and warms their scutcheons with a glance of gold such is the memory of poets old who on parnassus's hill have bloomed elate now they are laid under their marbles cold and turned to clay whereof they were create but god apollo hath them all unrolled and blazoned on the very clouds of fate end of poem this recording is in the public domain A Retrospective Review by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway Oh, when I was a tiny boy, my days and nights were full of joy, my mates were blithe and kind. No wonder that I sometimes sigh, and dash the teardrop from my eye, to cast a look behind. A hoop was an eternal round of pleasure in those days I found a top a joyous thing. But now those past delights I drop, my head, alas, is all my top, and careful thoughts the string. My marbles, once my bag was stored, now I must play with Elgin's lord, with Theseus for a tour. My playful horse has slipped his string, forgotten all his capering, and harnessed to the law. My kite, how fast and far it flew, whilst I a sort of Franklin drew, my pleasure from the sky. Twas papered o'er oh, with studious themes, the tasks I wrote, my present dreams, will never soar so high. My joys are wingless, all and dead. My dumps are made of more than lead. My flights soon find a fall. My fears prevail, my fancies droop. Joy never cometh with a hoop, and seldom with a call. My football's laid upon the shelf. I am a shuttlecock myself. The world knocks to and fro. 
my arteries all unlearned and grief against myself has turned my arrows and my bow no more in noontide sun i bask my authorship's an endless task my head's near out of school my heart is pained with scorn and slight i have too many foes to fight and friends grown strangely cool the very chum that shared my cake holds out so cold a hand to shake it makes me shrink and sigh on this i will not dwell and hang the changeling would not feel a pang though these should meet his eye no sky so blue or so serene as then no leaves look half so green as clothe the playground tree all things i love are altered so nor does it ease my heart to know that change resides in me oh for the garb that marked the boy the trousers made of corduroy well inked with black and red the crownless hat ne'er deemed an ill it only let the sunshine still repose upon my head oh for the ribband round the neck the careless dogs is apt to deck my book and collar both how can this formal man be styled merely an alexandra child a boy of larger growth oh for that small small beer anew and heaven's own type that milk sky blue that washed my sweet meals down the master even and that small turk that fagged me worse is now my work a fag for all the town oh for the lessons learned by heart i though the very birches smart should mark those hours again i'd kiss the rod and be resigned beneath the stroke and even find some sugar in the cane the arabian nights rehearsed in bed the fairy tales and school-time read by stealth twixt verb and noun the angel form that always walked in all my dreams and looked and talked exactly like miss brown the omni Benny christmas come the prize of merit won for home merit the prizes then but now i write for days and days for fame a deal of empty praise without the silver pen then home sweet home the crowded coach the joyous shout the loud approach the winding horns like rams the meeting sweet that made me thrill the sweet mills almost sweeter still no satis to the jams when that i was a tiny boy my days and nights were full of joy my mates were blithe and kind no wonder that i sometimes sigh and dash the teardrop from my eye to cast a look behind end of poem this recording is in the public domain ballad by thomas hood read for LibriVox.org by drew conway second of december two thousand and sixteen kent it was not in the winter our loving lot was cast it was the time of roses we plucked them as we passed that churlish season never frowned on early lovers yet oh no the world was newly crowned with flowers when we first met twas twilight when i bade you go but still you held me fast it was the time of roses we'd plucked them as we'd passed what else could peer thy glowing cheek that tears began to stud and when i asked the like of love you snatched a damask bud and oped it to the dainty core still glowing to the last it was the time of roses we plucked them as we passed end of poem this recording is in the public domain
time hope and memory by thomas hood read for librivox dot org by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c i heard a gentle maiden in the spring set her sweet sighs to music and thus sing fly through the world and i will follow thee only for looks that may turn back on me only for roses that your chance may throw though withered twill wear them on my brow to be a thoughtful fragrance to my brain warned with such love that they will bloom again thy love before thee i must tread behind kissing thy footprints though to me unkind but trust not for all her fondness though it seem let thy true love should rest on a false dream her face is smiling and her voice is sweet but smiles betray and music sings deceit and words speak false yet if they welcome prove i'll be their echo and repeat their love only if wakened to sad truth at last the bitterness to come and sweetness past when thou art vexed then turn again and see thou hast loved hope but memory loved thee end of poem this recording is in the public domain Flowers by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by John N. Daly. I will not have the mad Clytie, whose head is turned by the sun. The tulip is a courtly queen, whom therefore I will shun. The cowslip is a country wench, the violet is a nun. But I will woo the dainty rose, the queen of every one. The pea is but a wanton witch in too much haste to wed and clasps her rings on every hand the wolfsbane i should dread nor will i dreary rosemary that always mourns the dead but i will woo the dainty rose with her cheeks of tender red the lily is all in white like a saint and so is no mate for me and the daisy's cheek is tipped with a blush she is of such low degree Jasmine is sweet and has many loves, and the broom's betrothed to the bee. But I will plight with the dainty rose, for fairest of all is she. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ballad by Thomas Hood Read for LibriVox.org by Drew Conway 2nd of December, 2016, Kent She's up and gone, that graceless girl, And robbed my failing years. My blood before was thin and cold, But now tis turned to tears. My shadow falls upon my grave, So near the brink I stand. She might have stayed a little yet, And led me by the hand. I call her on the barren moor, and call her on the hill. Tis nothing but the heron's cry, and plover's answer shrill. My child is flown on wilder wings than they have ever spread, and I may even walk a waste that widened when she'd fled. Full many a thankless child has been, but never one like mine. Her meat was served on plates of gold, her drink was rosy wine. But now she'll share a robin's food, and sup the common rill, before her feet will turn again to meet her father's will. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Ruth by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by John N. Daly. She stood breast high amid the corn, 
clasped by the golden light of morn like the sweetheart of the sun who many a glowing kiss had won on her cheek an autumn flush deeply ripened such a blush in the midst of brown was born like red poppies grown with corn round her eyes her tresses fell which were blackest none could tell but long lashes veiled a light that had else been all too bright and her hat with shady brim made her tressy forehead dim thus she stood amid the stooks praising god with sweetest looks sure i said heaven did not mean where i reap thou shouldst but glean lay thy sheaf adown and come share my harvest and my home end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Plea of the Midsummer Fairies, one by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tucker. One. Twas in that mellow season of the year when the hot sun singes the yellow leaves till they be gold, and with a broader sphere the moon looks down on Ceres and her sheaves, when more abundantly the spider weaves and the cold wind breathes from a chillier clime that forth i fared on one of those still eves touched with the dewy sadness of the time to think how the bright months had spent their prime two so that whenever i addressed my way i seemed to track the melancholy feet of him that is the father of decay and spoils at once the sour weed and the sweet wherefore regretfully i made retreat to some unwasted regions of my brain charmed with the light of summer and the heat and bade that bounteous season bloom again and sprout fresh flowers in mine own domain three it was a shady and sequestered scene like those famed gardens of boccaccio planted with his own laurels evergreen and roses that for endless summer blow and there were fountain springs to overflow their marble basins and cool green arcades of tall o'er-arching sycamores to throw athwart the dappled path of their dancing shades with timid conies cropping the green blades four and there were crystal pools peopled with fish argent and gold and some of tyrian skin some crimson barred and ever at a wish they rose obsequious till the wave grew thin as glass upon their backs and then dived in quenching their ardent scales in watery gloom whilst others with fresh hues rode forth to win my changeable regard for so we doom things born of thought to vanish or to bloom five and there were many birds of many dyes from tree to tree still faring to and fro and stately peacocks with their splendid eyes and gorgeous pheasants with their golden glow like iris just bedabbled in her bow besides some vocalists without a name that oft on fairy errands come and go with accents magical and all were tame and peckled at my hand where'er i came six and for my sylvan company in lieu of pampinia with her lively peers sat queen titania with her pretty crew all in their liveries quaint with elfin gears for she was gracious to my childish years and made me free of her enchanted round wherefore this dreamy scene she still endears and plants her court upon a verdant mound fenced with umbrageous woods and groves profound seven ah me she cries was ever moonlight seen so clear and tender for our midnight trips go some one forth and with a trump convene my lieges all away the goblin skips a pace or two apart and deftly strips the ruddy skin from a sweet rose's cheek then blows the shuddering leaf between his lips making it utter forth a shrill small shriek like a frayed bird in the grey owlet's beak Eight and lo upon my fixed delighted ken appeared the loyal fays some by degrees crept from the primrose buds that opened then and some from bell-shaped blossoms like the bees some from the dewy meads and rushy lees flew up like chafers when the rustics pass some from the rivers others from tall trees dropped like shed blossoms silent to the grass spirits and elfins small of every class nine 
perry and pixie and quaint puck the antic brought robin goodfellow that merry swain and stealthy mab queen of old realms romantic came too from distance in her tiny wain fresh dripping from a cloud some bloomy rain then circling the bright moon had washed her car and still bedewed it with a various stain lastly came ariel shooting from a star who bears all fairy embassies afar Ten. but oberon that night elsewhere exiled was absent whether some distempered spleen kept him and his fair mate unreconciled or warfare with the gnome whose race had been some time obnoxious kept him from his queen and made her now peruse the starry skies prophetical with such an absent mien howbeit the tears stole often to her eyes and oft the moon was incensed with her sighs eleven which made the elves sport drearily and soon their hushing dancers languished to a stand like midnight leaves when as the zephyrs swoon all on their drooping stems they sink unfanned so into silence drooped the fairy band to see their empress dear so pale and still crowding her softly round on either hand as pale as frosty snowdrops and as chill to whom the sceptred dame reveals her ill twelve alas quoth she ye know our fairy lives are least upon the fickle faith of men not measured out against fate's mortal knives like human gossamers we perish when we fade and are forgot in worldly kens though poesy has thus prolonged our date thanks be to the sweet bard's auspicious pen that rescued us so long howbeit of late i feel some dark misgivings of our fate Thirteen and this dull day my melancholy sleep hath been so thronged with images of woe that even now i cannot choose but weep to think this was some sad prophetic show of future horror to befall us so of mortal wreck and uttermost distress yea our poor empires fall and overthrow for this was my long vision's dreadful stress and when i waked my trouble was not less Fourteen whenever to the clouds i tried to seek such leaden weight dragged these acarian wings my faithless wand was wavering and weak and slimy toads had trespassed in our rings the birds refused to sing for me all things disowned their old allegiance to our spells the rude bees pricked me with their rebel stings and when i passed the valley lily's bells rang out methought most melancholy knells Fifteen and ever on the faint and flagging air a doleful spirit with a dreary note cried in my fearful ear prepare prepare which soon i knew came from a raven's throat perched on a cypress bough not far remote a cursed bird too crafty to be shot that alway cometh with his soot black coat to make hearts dreary for he is a blot upon the book of life as well ye wot sixteen wherefore some while i bribed him to be mute with bitter acorns stuffing his foul maw which barely i appeased when some fresh brute startled me all a heap and soon i saw the horridest shape that ever raised my awe a monstrous giant very huge and tall such as in elder times devoid of law with wicked might grieved the primeval ball and this was sure the deadliest of them all Seventeen gaunt was he as a wolf of languedoc with bloody jaws and frost upon his crown so from his barren pole one hoary lock over his wrinkled front fell far adown well nigh to where his frosty brows did frown like jagged icicles at cottage eaves and for his coronal he wore some brown and bristled ears gathered from ceres sheaves entwined with certain sear and russet leaves Eighteen and lo upon a mast reared far aloft he bore a very bright and crescent blade the which he waved so dreadfully and oft in meditative spite that sore dismayed i crept into an acorn cup for shade meanwhile the horrid effigy went by i trow his look was dreadful for it made the trembling birds betake them to the sky for every leaf was lifted by his sigh Nineteen and ever as he sighed his foggy breath blurred out the landscape like a flight of smoke thence knew i this was either dreary death or time who leads all creatures to his stroke ah wretched me here even as she spoke the melancholy shape came gliding in and leaned his back against an antique oak 
folding his wings that were so fine and thin they scarce were seen against the dryad's skin twenty then what a fear seized all the little rout look how a flock of panicked sheep will stare and huddle close and start and wheel about watching the roaming mongrel here and there so did that sudden apparition scare all closer heap those small affrighted things nor sought they now the safety of the air as if some leaden spell withheld their wings but who can fly that ancientest of kings twenty one whom now the queen with a forestalling tear and previous sigh beginneth to entreat bidding him spare for love her lieges dear alas quoth she is there no nodding wheat ripe for thy crooked weapon and more meat or withered leaves to ravish from the tree or crumbling battlements for thy defeat think but what vaunting monuments there be builded in spite and mockery of thee twenty two o oh, fret away the fabric walls of fame and grind down marble caesars with the dust make tombs inscriptionless raise each high name and waste old armours of renown with rust do all of this and thy revenge is just make such decays the trophies of thy prime and check ambition's overweening lust that dares exterminating war with time but we are guiltless of that lofty crime twenty three frail feeble spirits the children of a dream least on the sufferance of fickle men like motes dependent on the sunny beam living but in the sun's indulgent ken and when that light withdraws withdrawing then so do we flutter in the glance of youth and fervid fancy and so perish when the eye of faith grows aged in sad truth feeling thy sway o time though not thy tooth twenty four where be those old divinities forlorn that dwelt in trees or haunted in a stream alas their memories are dimmed and torn like the remainder tatters of a dream so will it fare with our poor thrones i deem for us the same dark trench oblivion delves that holds the wastes of every human scheme o oh, spare us then and these are pretty elves we soon alas shall perish of ourselves Twenty five now as she ended with a sigh to name those old olympians scattered by the whirl of fortune's giddy wheel and brought to shame methought a scornful and malignant curl showed on the lips of that malicious churl to think what noble havocs he had made so that i feared he all at once would hurl the harmless fairies into endless shade howbeit he stopped a while to whet his blade twenty six pity it was to hear the elfins wail rise up in concert from their mingled dread pity it was to see them all so pale gaze on the grass as for a dying bed but puck was seated on a spider's thread that hung between two branches of a briar and gan to swing and gamble heels o'er head like any southwark tumbler on a wire for him no present grief could long inspire twenty seven meanwhile the queen with many piteous drops falling like tiny sparks full fast and free bedews a pathway from her throne and stops before the foot of her arch enemy and with her little arms enfolds his knee that shows more grisly from that fair embrace but she will ne'er depart alas quoth she my painful fingers i will here enlace till i have gained your pity for our race twenty eight what have we ever done to earn this grudge and hate if not too humble for thy hating look o'er our labours and our lives and judge if there be any ills of our creating for we are very kindly creatures dating with nature's charities still sweet and bland o oh, think this murder worthy of debating herewith she makes a signal with her hand to beckon some one from the fairy band twenty nine anon i saw one of those elfin things clad all in white like any chorister come fluttering forth on his melodious wings that made soft music at each little stir but something louder than a bee's demur before he lights upon a bunch of broom and thus gan he with satin to confer and oh his voice was sweet touched with the gloom of that sad theme that argued of his doom thirty 
quoth he we make all melodies our care that no false discords may offend the sun music's great master tuning everywhere all pastoral sounds and melodies each one duly to place and season so that none may harshly interfere we rouse at morn the shrill sweet lark and when the day is done hush silent pauses for the bird forlorn that singeth with her breast against a thorn thirty one we gather in loud choirs the twittering race that make a chorus with their single note and tend on new-fledged birds in every place that duly they may get their tunes by rote and oft like echoes answering remote we hide in thickets from the feathered throng and strain in rivalship each throbbing throat singing in shrill responses all day long whilst the glad truant listens to our song thirty two wherefore great king of years as thou dost love the raining music from a morning cloud when vanished larks are carolling above to wake apollo with their pipings loud if ever thou hast heard in leafy shroud the sweet and plaintive sappho of the dell show thy sweet mercy on this little crowd and we will muffle up the sheepfold bell whene'er thou listenest to philomel thirty three then saturn thus sweet is the merry lark that carols in man's ear so clear and strong and youth must love to listen in the dark that tuneful elegy of tereus's wrong but i have heard that ancient strain too long for sweet is sweet but when a little strange and i grow weary for some newer song for wherefore had i wings unless to range through all things mutable from change to change thirty four but wouldst thou hear the melodies of time listen when sleep and drowsy darkness roll over hushed cities and the midnight chime sounds from their hundred clocks and deep bells toll like a last knell over the dead world's soul saying time shall be final of all things whose late last voice must elegize the whole oh then i clap aloft my brave broad wings and make the wide air tremble while it rings thirty five then next a fair eve fay made meek address saying we be the handmaids of the spring in sign whereof may the quaint broideress hath wrought her samplers on our gauzy wing we tend upon buds birth and blossoming and count the leafy tributes that they owe as so much to the earth so much to fling in showers to the brook so much to go in whirlwinds to the clouds that made them grow thirty six the pastoral cowslips are our little pets and daisy stars whose firmament is green pansies and those veiled nuns meek violets sighing to that warm world from which they screen and golden daffodils plucked for may's queen and lonely harebells quaking on the heath and hyacinth long since a fair youth seen whose tuneful voice turned fragrance in his breath kissed by sad zephyr guilty of his death thirty seven the widowed primrose weeping to the moon and saffron crocus in whose chalice bright a cool libation hoarded for the noon is kept and she that purifies the light the virgin lily faithful to her white whereon eve wept in eden for her shame and the most dainty rose aurora's sprite our every godchild by whatever name spares us our lives for we did nurse the same thirty eight then that old mower stamped his heel and struck his hurtful scythe against the harmless ground saying ye foolish imps when am i stuck with gaudy buds or like a wooer crowned with flowery chaplets save when they are found withered whenever have i plucked a rose except to scatter its vain leaves around for so all gloss of beauty i oppose and bring decay on every flower that blows thirty nine or when i am so wroth as when i view the wanton pride of summer how she decks the birthday world with blossoms ever new as if time had not lived and heaped great wrecks of years on years oh then i bravely vex and catch the gay months in their gaudy plight and slay them with the wreaths about their necks like foolish heifers in the holy rite and raise great trophies to my ancient might forty then saith another we are kindly things and like her offspring nestle with the dove witness these hearts embroidered on our wings to show our constant patronage of love 
we sit at even in sweet bowers above lovers and shake rich odours on the air to mingle with their sighs and still remove the startling owl and bid the bat forbear their privacy and haunt some other where forty one and we are near the mother when she sits beside her infant in its wicker bed and we are in the fairy scene that flits across its tender brain sweet dreams we shed and whilst the tender little soul is fled away to sport with our young elves the while we touch the dimpled cheek with roses red and tickle the soft lips until they smile so that their careful parents they beguile forty two oh then if ever thou hast breathed avow at love's dear portal or at pale moonrise crushed the dear curl on a regardful brow that did not frown thee from thy honey prize if ever thy sweet son sat on thy thighs and wooed thee from thy careful thoughts within to watch the harmless beauty of his eyes or glad thy fingers on his smooth soft skin for love's dear sake let us thy pity win end of the plea of the midsummer fairies one this librivox recording is in the public domain The Plea of the Midsummer Fairies, two, by Thomas Hood, read for LibriVox.org by Peter Tucker. Forty-three. Then Saturn fiercely thus: What joy have I in tender babes that have devoured mine own? Whenever to the light I heard them cry, till foolish rare cheated me with stone. Whereon till now is my great hunger shown in monstrous dint of my enormous tooth and but the peopled world is too full grown for hunger's edge i would consume all youth at one great meal without delay or ruth forty four for i am well nigh crazed and wild to hear how boastful fathers taunt me with their breed saying we shall not die nor disappear but in these other selves ourselves succeed even as ripe flowers pass into their seed only to be renewed from prime to prime all of which boastings i am forced to read besides a thousand challenges to time which bragging lovers have compiled in rhyme forty five wherefore when they are sweetly met a nights there will i steal and with my hurried hand startle them suddenly from their delights before the next encounter hath been planned ravishing hours in little minutes spanned but when they say farewell and grieve apart then like a leaden statue i will stand meanwhile their many tears encrust my dart and with a ragged edge cut heart from heart forty six then next a merry woodsman clad in green step vanward from his mates that idly stood each at his proper ease as they had been nursed in the liberty of old sherwood and wore the livery of robin hood who wont in forest shades to dine and sup so came this chief right frankly and made good his haunch against his axe and thus spoke up doffing his cap which was an acorn's cup forty seven we be small foresters and gay who tend on trees and all their furniture of green training the young boughs airily to bend and show blue snatches of the sky between or knit more close intricacies to screen birds crafty dwellings as may hide them best but most the timid blackbirds she that seen will bear black poisonous berries to her nest lest man should cage the darlings of her breast forty eight we bend each tree in proper attitude and founting willows train in silvery falls we frame all shady roofs and arches rude and verdant aisles leading to dryads halls or deep recesses where the echo calls we shape all plumy trees against the sky and carve tall elms corinthian capitals when sometimes as our tiny hatchets ply men say the tapping woodpecker is nigh forty nine sometimes we scoop the squirrel's hollow cell and sometimes carve quaint letters on trees rind that haply some lone musing white may spell dainty aminta gentle rosalind or chastest laura sweetly called to mind in sylvan solitudes ere he lies down and sometimes we enrich grey stems with twined and vagrant ivy or rich moss whose brown burns into gold as the warm sun goes down fifty 
and lastly for mirth's sake and christmas cheer we bear the seedling berries for increase to graft the druid oaks from year to year careful that mistletoe may never cease wherefore if thou dost prize the shady peace of sombre forests or to see light break through sylvan cloisters and in spring release thy spirit amongst leaves from careful ache spare us our lives for the green dryad's sake fifty one then saturn with a frown go forth and fell oak for your coffins and thenceforth lay by your axes for the rust and bid farewell to all sweet birds and the blue peeps of sky through tangled branches for ye shall not spy the next green generation of the tree but hence with the dead leaves when e'er they fly which in the bleak air i would rather see than flights of the most tuneful birds that be fifty two for i dislike all prime and verdant pets ivy except that on the aged wall preys with its worm-like roots and daily frets the crumbled tower it seems to league withal king-like worn down by its own coronal neither in forest haunts love i to wan before the golden plumage gins to fall and leaves the brown bleak limbs with few leaves on or bare like nature in her skeleton fifty three for then sit i amongst the crooked boughs wooing dull memory with kindred sighs and there in rustling nuptials we espouse smit by the sadness in each other's eyes but hope must have green bowers and blue skies and must be courted with the gauds of spring whilst youth leans godlike on her lap and cries what shall we always do but love and sing and time is reckoned a discarded thing fifty four herein my dream it made me fret to see how puck the antic all this dreary while had blithely jested with calamity with mistimed mirth mocking the doleful style of his sad comrades till it raised my bile to see him so reflect their grief aside turning their solemn looks to have a smile like a straight stick shown crooked in the tide but soon a novel advocate i spied fifty five quoth he we teach all natures to fulfil their four appointed crafts and instincts meet the bee's sweet alchemy the spider's skill the pismire's care to garner up his wheat and rustic masonry to swallows fleet the lapwing's cunning to preserve her nest but most that lesser pelican the sweet and shrilly ruddock with its bleeding breast in tender pity of poor babes distressed fifty six sometimes we cast our shapes and in sleek skins delve with the timid mole that aptly delves from our example so the spider spins and eke the silkworm patterned by ourselves sometimes we travel on the summer shelves of early bees and busy toils commence watched of wise men that know not we are elves but gaze and marvel at our stretch of sense and praise our human-like intelligence fifty seven wherefore by thy delight in that old tale and plaintive dirges the late robins sing what time the leaves are scattered by the gale mindful of that old forest burying as thou dost love to watch each tiny thing for whom our craft most curiously contrives if thou hast caught a bee upon the wing to take his honey-bag spare us our lives and we will pay the ransom in full hives Fifty eight now by my glass quoth time ye do offend in teaching the brown bees that careful lore and frugal ants whose millions would have end but they lay up for need a timely store and travel with the seasons evermore whereas great mammoth long hath passed away and none but i can tell what hide he wore whilst purblind men the creatures of a day in riddling wonder his great bones survey fifty nine then came an elf right beauteous to behold whose coat was like a brooklet that the sun hath all embroidered with its crooked gold it was so quaintly wrought and overrun with spangled traceries most meet for one that was a warden of the pearly streams and as he stepped out of the shadows dun his jewels sparkled in the pale moon's gleams and shot into the air their pointed beams sixty quoth he we bear the gold and silver keys of bubbling springs and fountains that below course through the veiny earth which when they freeze into hard chrysolites we bid to flow creeping like subtle snakes 
when as they go we guide their windings to melodious falls at whose soft murmurings so sweet and low poets have tuned their smoothest madrigals to sing to ladies in their banquet halls sixty one and when the hot sun with his steadfast heat parches the river god whose dusty urn drips miserly till soon his crystal feet against his pebbly floor wax faint and burn and languid fish unpoised grow sick and yearn then scoop we hollows in some sandy nook and little channels dig wherein we turn the thread-worn rivulet that all forsook the naiad lily pining for her brook sixty two wherefore by thy delight in cool green meads with living sapphires daintily inlaid in all soft songs of waters and their reeds and all reflections in a streamlet made haply of thine own love that disarrayed kills the fair lily with a livelier white by silver trouts upspringing from green shade and winking stars reduplicate at night spare us poor ministers to such delight sixty three howbeit his pleading and his gentle looks moved not the spiteful shade quoth he your taste shoots wide of mine for i despise the brooks and slavish rivulets that run to waste in noontide sweats or like poor vassals haste to swell the vast dominion of the sea in whose great presence i am held disgraced and neighboured with a king that rivals me in ancient might and hoary majesty fifty four whereas i ruled in chaos and still keep the awful secrets of that ancient dearth before the briny fountains of the deep brimmed up the hollow cavities of earth i saw each trickling sea-god at his birth each pearly naiad with her oozy locks and infant titans of enormous girth whose huge young feet yet stumbled on the rocks stunning the early world with frequent shocks Sixty five where now is titan with his cumbrous brood that scared the world by this sharp scythe they fell and half the sky was curdled with their blood so have all primal giants sighed farewell no wardens now by sedgy fountains dwell nor pearly naiads all their days are done that strove with time untimely to excel wherefore i raised their progenies and none but my great shadow intercepts the sun sixty six then saith the timid fay o mighty time well hast thou wrought the cruel titans fall for they were stained with many a bloody crime great giants work great wrongs but we are small for love goes lowly but oppression's tall and with surpassing strides goes foremost still where love indeed can hardly reach at all like a poor dwarf or burthened with good will that labours to efface the tracks of ill sixty seven man even strives with man but we eschew the guilty feud and all fierce strifes of awe nay we are gentle as the sweet heaven's dew beside the red and horrid drops of war weeping the cruel hates men battle for which worldly bosoms nourish in our spite for in the gentle breast we ne'er withdraw but only when all love hath taken flight and youth's warm gracious heart is hardened quite sixty eight so are our gentle natures intertwined with sweet humanities and closely knit in kindly sympathy with humankind witness how we befriend with elfin wit all hopeless maids and lovers nor omit magical suckers unto hearts forlorn we charm man's life and do not perish it so judge us by the helps we showed this morn to one who held his wretched days in scorn sixty nine twas nigh sweet amwell for the queen had tasked our skill to-day amidst the silver lee whereon the noontide sun had not yet basked wherefore some patient man we thought to see planted in moss-grown rushes to the knee beside the cloudy margin cold and dim howbeit no patient fisherman was he that cast his sudden shadow from the brim making us leave our toils to gaze on him seventy his face was ashy pale and leaden care had sunk the level arches of his brow once bridges for his joyous thoughts to fare over those melancholy springs and slow that from his piteous eyes began to flow and fell anon into the chilly stream which as his mimicked image showed below wrinkled his face with many a needless seam making grief sadder in its own esteem seventy one 
and lo upon the air we saw him stretch his passionate arms and in a wayward strain he gan to elegize that fellow wretch that with mute gestures answered him again saying poor slave how long wilt thou remain life's sad weak captive in a prison strong hoping with tears to rust away thy chain in bitter servitude to worldly wrong thou wearest that mortal livery too long seventy two this with more spleenful speeches and some tears when he had spent upon the imaged wave speedily i convened my elfin peers under the lily cups that we might save this woeful mortal from a wilful grave by shrewd diversions of his mind's regret seeing he was mere melancholy's slave that sank wherever a dark cloud he met and straight was tangled in her secret net seventy three therefore as still he watched the waters flow daintily we transformed and with bright fins came glancing through the gloom some from below rose like dim fancies when a dream begins snatching the light upon their purple skins then under the broad leaves made slow retire one like a golden galley bravely wins its radiant course another glows like fire making that wayward man our pranks admire seventy four and so he banished thought and quite forgot all contemplation of that wretched face and so we wiled him from that lonely spot along the river's brink till by heaven's grace he met a gentle haunter of the place full of sweet wisdom gathered from the brooks who there discussed his melancholy case with wholesome texts learned from kind nature's books meanwhile he newly trimmed his lines and hooks seventy five herewith the fairy ceased quoth ariel now let me remember how i saved a man whose fatal noose was fastened on a bough intended to abridge his sad life's span for haply i was by when he began his stern soliloquy in life dispraise and overheard his melancholy plan how he had made a vow to end his days and therefore followed him in all his ways seventy six through brake and tangled copse for much he loathed all populous haunts and roamed in forests rude to hide himself from man but i had clothed my delicate limbs with plumes and still pursued where only foxes and wild cats intrude till we were come beside an ancient tree late blasted by a storm here he renewed his loud complaints choosing that spot to be the scene of his last horrid tragedy seventy seven it was a wild and melancholy glen made gloomy by tall firs and cypress dark whose roots like any bones of buried men pushed through the rotten sod for fear's remark a hundred horrid stems jagged and stark wrestled with crooked arms in hideous fray besides sleek ashes with their dappled bark like crafty serpents climbing for a prey with many blasted oaks moss-grown and grey seventy eight but here upon his final desperate claws suddenly i pronounced so sweet a strain like a panged nightingale it made him pause till half the frenzy of his grief was slain the sad remainder oozing from his brain in timely ecstasies of healing tears which through his ardent eyes began to drain meanwhile the deadly fates unclosed their shears so pity me and all my fated peers Seventy-nine thus ariel ended and was some time hushed when with the hoary shape a fresh tongue pleads and red as rose the gentle fairy blushed to read the records of her own good deeds it chanced quoth she in seeking through the meads for honeyed cowslips sweetest in the morn whilst yet the buds were hung with dewy beads and echo answered to the huntsman's horn we found a babe left in the swathes forlorn eighty a little sorrowful deserted thing begot of love and yet no love begetting guiltless of shame and yet for shame to wring and too soon banished from a mother's petting to churlish nurture and the wide world's fretting for alien pity and unnatural care alas to see how the cold dew kept wetting his childish coats and dabbled all his hair like gossamers across his forehead fair eighty one his pretty pouting mouth witless of speech lay halfway open like a rose-lipped shell and his young cheek was softer than a peach whereon his tears for roundness could not dwell but quickly rolled themselves to pearls and fell 
some on the grass and some against his hand or haply wandered to the dimpled well which love beside his mouth had sweetly planned yet not for tears but mirth and smilings bland eighty two pity it was to see those frequent tears falling regardless from his friendless eyes there was such beauty in those twin blue spheres as any mother's heart might leap to prize blue were they like the zenith of the skies softened betwixt two clouds both clear and mild just touched with thought and yet not over wise they showed the gentle spirit of a child not yet by care or any craft defiled eighty three pity it was to see the ardent sun scorching his helpless limbs it shone so warm for kindly shade or shelter he had none nor mother's gentle breast come fair or storm meanwhile i bade my pitying mates transform like grasshoppers and then with shrilly cries all round the infant noisily we swarm haply some passing rustic to advise whilst providential heaven our care espies eighty four and sends full soon a tender-hearted hind who wondering at our loud unusual note strays curiously aside and so doth find the orphan child laid in the grass remote and laps the foundling in his russet coat who thence was nurtured in his kindly cot but how he prospered let proud london quote how wise how rich and how renowned he got and chief of all her citizens i wot end of section forty six the plea of the midsummer fairies three by thomas hood read for librivox dot org by peter tucker eighty five witness his goodly vessels on the thames whose holds were fraught with costly merchandise jewels from ind and pearls for courtly dames and gorgeous silks that samarkand supplies witness that royal bourse he bade arise the mart of merchants from the east and west whose slender summit pointing to the skies still bears in token of his grateful breast the tender grasshopper his chosen crest eighty six the tender grasshopper his chosen crest that all the summer with a tuneful wing makes merry chirpings in its grassy nest inspirited with dew to leap and sing so let us also live eternal king partakers of the green and pleasant earth pity it is to slay the meanest thing that like a moat shines in the smile of mirth enough there is of joy's decrease and dearth eighty seven enough of pleasure and delight and beauty perished and gone and hasting to decay enough to sadden even thee whose duty or spite it is to havoc and to slay too many a lovely race raised quite away hath left large gaps in life and human loving here then begin thy cruel war to stay and spare fresh sighs and tears and groans reproving thy desolating hand for our removing eighty eight now here i heard a shrill and sudden cry and looking up i saw the antique puck grappling with time who clutched him like a fly victim of his own sport the jester's luck he whilst his fellows grieved poor wight had stuck his freakish gourds upon the ancient's brow and now his ear and now his beard would pluck whereas the angry churl had snatched him now crying thou impish mischief who art thou eighty nine alas quoth puck a little random elf born in the sport of nature like a weed for simple sweet enjoyment of myself but for no other purpose worth or need and yet withal of a most happy breed and there is robin goodfellow besides my partner dear in many a prankish deed to make dame laughter hold her jolly sides like merry mummers twain on holy tides ninety tis we that bob the angler's idle cork till e'en the patient man breathes half a curse we steal the morsel from the gossip's fork and curdling looks with secret straws disperse or stop the sneezing chanter at mid-verse and when an infant's beauty prospers ill we change some mothers say the child at nurse but any graver purpose to fulfil we have not wit enough and scarce the will ninety one we never let the canker melancholy to gather on our faces like a rust but glass our features with some change of folly taking life's fabled miseries on trust but only sorrowing when sorrow must we ruminate no sage's solemn cud 
but own ourselves a pinch of lively dust to frisk upon a wind whereas the flood of tears would turn us into heavy mud ninety two beshrew those sad interpreters of nature who glows her lively universal law as if she had not formed our cheerful feature to be so tickled with the slightest straw so let them vex their mumbling mouths and draw the corners downward like a watery moon and deal in gusty sighs and rainy floor we will not woo foul weather all too soon or nurse november on the lap of june ninety three for ours are winging sprites like any bird that shun all stagnant settlements of grief and even in our rest our hearts are stirred like insects settled on a dancing leaf this is our small philosophy in brief which thus to teach hath set me all agape but dost thou relish it o hoary chief unclasp thy crooked fingers from my nape and i will show thee many a pleasant scrape ninety four then saturn thus shaking his crooked blade o'erhead which made aloft a lightning flash in all the fairies eyes dismally frayed his ensuing voice came like the thunder crash meanwhile the bolt shatters some pine or ash thou feeble wanton foolish fickle thing whom nought can frighten sadden or abash to hope my solemn countenance to ring to idiot smiles but i will prune thy wing ninety five lo this most awful handle of my scythe stood once a maypole with a flowery crown which rustics danced around and maidens blithe to wanton pipings but i plucked it down and robed the may queen in a churchyard gown turning her buds to rosemary and rue and all their merry minstrelsy did drown and laid each lusty leaper in the dew so thou shalt fare and every jovial crew ninety six here he lets go the struggling imp to clutch his mortal engine with each grisly hand which frights the elfin progeny so much they huddle in a heap and trembling stand all round titania like the queen bee's band with sighs and tears and very shrieks of woe meanwhile some moving argument i planned to make the stern shade merciful when lo he drops his fatal scythe without a blow ninety seven for just at need a timely apparition steps in between to bear the awful brunt making him change his horrible position to marvel at this comer brave and blunt that dares time's irresistible affront whose strokes have scarred even the gods of old whereas this seemed a mortal at mere hunt for conies lighted by the moonshine cold or stalker of stray deer stealthy and bold ninety eight who turning to the small assembled phase doffs to the lily queen his courteous cap and holds her beauty for a while in gaze with bright eyes kindling at this pleasant hap and thence upon the fair moon's silver map as if in question of this magic chance laid like a dream upon the green earth's lap and then upon old saturn turns askance exclaiming with a glad and kindly glance ninety nine oh these be fancy's revellers by night stealthy companions of the downy moth diana's motes that flit in her pale light shunners of sunbeams in diurnal sloth these be the feasters on night's silver cloth the gnat with shrilly trump is their convener forth from their flowery chambers nothing loath with lulling tunes to charm the air serener or dance upon the grass to make it greener one hundred these be the pretty genii of the flowers daintily fed with honey and pure dew midsummer's phantoms in her dreaming hours king oberon and all his merry crew the darling puppets of romance's view fairies and sprites and goblin elves we call them famous for patronage of lovers true no harm they act neither shall harm befall them so do not thus with crabbed frowns appall them one hundred and one oh what a cry was saturn's then it made the fairies crake what care i for their pranks however they may lovers choose to aid or dance their roundelays on flowery banks long must they dance before they earn my thanks so step aside to some far safer spot whilst with my hungry scythe i mow their ranks and leave them in the sun like weeds to rot and with the next day's sun to be forgot one hundred and two anon he raised afresh his weapon keen but still the gracious shade disarmed his aim 
stepping with brave alacrity between and made his sore arm powerless and tame his be perpetual glory for the shame of hoary saturn in that grand defeat but i must tell how here titania came with all her kneeling lieges to entreat his kindly succour in sad tones but sweet one hundred and three saying thou seest a wretched queen before thee the fading power of a failing land who for a kingdom kneeleth to implore thee now menaced by this tyrant's spoiling hand no one but thee can hopefully withstand that crooked blade he longeth so to lift i pray thee blind him with his own vile sand which only times all ruins by its drift or prune his eagle wings that are so swift one hundred and four or take him by that sole and grizzled tuft that hangs upon his bald and barren crown and we will sing to see him so rebuffed and lend our little mites to pull him down and make brave sport of his malicious frown for all his boastful mockery o'er men for thou wast born i know for this renown by my most magical and inward ken that readeth even at fate's forestalling pen One hundred and five nay by the golden lustre of thine eye and by thy brow's most fair and ample span thought's glorious palace framed for fancies high and by thy cheek thus passionately wan i know the signs of an immortal man nature's chief darling and illustrious mate destined to foil old death's oblivious plan and shine untarnished by the fogs of fate time's famous rival till the final date one hundred and six or shield us then from this usurping time and we will visit thee in moonlight dreams and teach thee tunes to wed unto thy rhyme and dance about thee in all midnight gleams giving thee glimpses of our magic schemes such as no mortal's eye hath ever seen and for thy love to us in our extremes will ever keep thy chaplet fresh and green such as no poet's wreath hath ever been One hundred and seven and we'll distill thee aromatic dews to charm thy sense when there shall be no flowers and flavoured syrups in thy drinks infuse and teach the nightingale to haunt thy bowers and with our games divert thy weariest hours with all that elfin wits can e'er devise and this churl dead there'll be no hasting hours to rob thee of thy joys as now joy flies here she was stopped by saturn's furious cries One hundred and eight whom therefore the kind shade rebukes anew saying thou haggard sin go forth and scoop thy hollow coffin in some churchyard yew or make the autumnal flowers turn pale and droop or fell the bearded corn till gleaners stoop under fat sheaves or blast the piney grove but here thou shalt not harm this pretty group whose lives are not so frail and feebly wove but least on nature's loveliness and love One hundred and nine tis these that free the small entangled fly caught in the venomed spider's crafty snare these be the petty surgeons that apply the healing balsams to the wounded hair bedded in bloody fern no creatures care these be providers for the orphan brood whose tender mother hath been slain in air quitting with gaping bill her darling's food hard by the verge of her domestic wood One hundred and ten tis these befriend the timid trembling stag when with a bursting heart beset with fears he feels his saving speed begin to flag for then they quench the fatal taint with tears and prompt fresh shifts in his alarmed ears so piteously they view all bloody morts or if the gunner with his arms appears like noisy pies and jays with harsh reports they warn the wild fowl of his deadly sports One hundred and eleven for these are kindly ministers of nature to soothe all covert hurts and dumb distress pretty they be and very small of stature for mercy still consorts with littleness wherefore the sum of good is still the less and mischief grossest in this world of wrong so do these charitable dwarfs redress the tenfold ravages of giants strong to whom great malice and great might belong One hundred and twelve likewise to them are poets much beholden for secret favours in the midnight glooms brave spencer quaffed out of their goblets golden and saw their tables spread of prompt mushrooms and heard their horns of honeysuckle blooms sounding upon the air most soothing soft like humming bees busy about the brooms and glanced this fair queen's witchery full oft and in her magic wane soared far aloft One hundred and thirteen 
nay i myself though mortal once was nursed by fairy gossips friendly at my birth and in my childish ear glib mab rehearsed her breezy travels round our planet's girth telling me wonders of the moon and earth my grammary at her grave lap i conned where puck hath been convened to make me mirth i have had from queen titania tokens fond and toyed with oberon's permitted wand 114 with figs and plums and persian dates they fed me and delicate cates after my sunset meal and took me by my childish hand and led me by craggy rocks crested with keeps of steel whose awful bases deep dark woods conceal staining some dead lake with their verdant dyes and when the west sparkled at phoebus's wheel with fairy euphrasy they purged mine eyes to let me see their cities in the skies One hundred and fifteen twas they first schooled my young imagination to take its flights like any new-fledged bird and showed the span of winged meditation stretched wider than things grossly seen or heard with sweet swift aerial how i soared and stirred the fragrant blooms of spiritual bowers twas they endeared what i have still preferred nature's blessed attributes and balmy powers her hills and vales and brooks sweet birds and flowers One hundred and sixteen wherefore with all true loyalty and duty will i regard them in my honouring rhyme with love for love and homages to beauty and magic thoughts gathered in night's cool clime with studious verse trancing the dragon time strong as old merlin's necromantic spells so these dear monarchs of the summer's prime shall live unstartled by his dreadful yells till shrill larks warn them to their flowery cells One hundred and seventeen look how a poisoned man turns livid black drugged with a cup of deadly hellebore that sets his horrid features all at rack so seemed these words into the ear to pour of ghastly saturn answering with a roar of mortal pain and spite and utmost rage wherewith his grisly arm he raised once more and bade the clustered sinews all engage as if at one fell stroke to wreck an age One hundred and eighteen whereas the blade flashed on the dinted ground down through his steadfast foe yet made no scar on that immortal shade or death-like wound but time was long benumbed and stood ajar and then with baffled rage took flight afar to weep his hurt in some cimmerian gloom or meaner fames like mine to mock and mar or sharp his scythe for royal strokes of doom whetting its edge on some old caesar's tomb One hundred and nineteen howbeit he vanished in the forest shade distantly heard as if some grumbling pard and like nymph echo to a sound decayed meanwhile the fays clustered the gracious bard the darling centre of their dear regard besides of sundry dancers on the green never was mortal man so brightly starred or won such pretty homages i ween nod to him elves cries the melodious queen One hundred and twenty nod to him elves and flutter round about him and quite enclose him with your pretty crowd and touch him lovingly for that without him the silkworm now had spun our dreary shroud but he hath all dispersed death's tearful cloud and time's dread effigy scared quite away bow to him then as though to me ye bowed and his dear wishes prosper and obey wherever love and wit can find a way One hundred and twenty one noint him with fairy dews of magic savours shaken from orient buds still pearly wet roses and spicy pinks and of all favours plant in his walks the purple violet and meadow sweet under the hedges set to mingle breaths with dainty eglantine and honeysuckle sweet nor yet forget some pastoral flowery chaplets to entwine to vie the thoughts about his brow benign One hundred and twenty-two let no wild things astonish him or fear him but tell them all how mild he is of heart till e'en the timid hares go frankly near him and eke the dapple does yet never start nor shall their fawns into the thickets dart nor wrens forsake their nests among the leaves nor speckled thrushes flutter far apart but bid the sacred swallow haunt his eaves to guard his roof from lightning and from thieves One hundred and twenty-three or when he goes the nimble squirrel's visitor let the brown hermit bring his hoarded nuts for tell him this is nature's kind inquisitor though man keeps cautious doors that conscience shuts for conscious wrong all curious quest rebuts 
nor yet shall bees uncase their jealous stings however he may watch their straw-built huts so let him learn the crafts of all small things which he will hint most aptly when he sings one hundred and twenty four here she leaves off and with a graceful hand waves thrice three splendid circles round his head which though deserted by the radiant wand wears still the glory which her waving shed such as erst crowned the old apostle's head to show the thoughts there harboured were divine and on immortal contemplations fed goodly it was to see that glory shine around a brow so lofty and benign one hundred and twenty five goodly it was to see the elfin brood contend for kisses of his gentle hand that had their mortal enemy withstood and stayed their lives fast ebbing with the sand long while this strife engaged the pretty band but now bold chanticleer from farm to farm challenged the dawn creeping o'er eastern land and well the fairies knew that shrill alarm which sounds the knell of every elfish charm one hundred and twenty six and soon the rolling mist that gan arise from plashy mead and undiscovered stream earth's morning incense to the early skies crept o'er the failing landscape of my dream soon faded then the phantom of my theme a shapeless shade that fancy disavowed and shrank to nothing in the mystic stream then flew titania and her little crowd like flocking linnets vanished in a cloud end of section forty seven end of poem 